I'm going to talk about uh, my use of social media in teaching and learning. And I want to emphasize that although I am talking a, a lot about technology today, uh, it's really about the methods of teaching and learning that the technology uh, has afforded. I go uh, back to Doug Engelbart, who invented most of what we use today uh, in the 1960s, when he talked about humans using language, artifacts, methodology, and training. We, we've seen the, the artifacts, the, the technology, evolve to be, become billions of times more powerful than it was in Doug Engelbart's time. But the, the integration of the technology into our teaching and learning has been a bit slower. We talk about a new culture of learning that exists inside and outside of the educational institutions that are afforded by the technologies that are, are now available. It's, uh, there's a book on this by Douglas Thomas and John C. Lee Brown on a new culture of learning, if you want to delve into that more deeply. It's learner-centered more than ever, rather than institution-centered or teacher-centered. And it's increasingly self-directed, in which the individual learner has a great deal more latitude in directing their learning. It's also extremely social and peer-to-peer, -peer, and we're going to circle back to that because I think one of the things that we're heading to is more and more of peer learning. That's what humans do. Social learning is one of the things that makes us human. This, the schooling system in which the Learning uh, took place on a broadcast model. I think this is really a historical anomaly that is uh, probably going away. It's increasingly inquiry-based. Uh, we live in a world in which uh, knowing how to ask the right questions is more important uh, often than being able to memorize the answers. It's collaborative in which increasingly learners work together on projects. But it's also cooperative, and I want to, to make the distinction between collaborative work in which people work together on projects and cooperative work in which they make a positive commitment to co-learning, to, to teaching each other and helping each other learn, uh, rather than being a individual passive receivers of, of what the teacher is broadcasting. And, of course, it's, it's networked. We're connected not only to each other, but to fantastic learning resources all over the world. I really started thinking about this quite a while ago. This is a page from the article in 1987 where I first put the, the term virtual community into the literature. And, and if you look at that, that article, you see I was talking about the, the way that people who shared an interest uh, but who may not have known each other before can also share information uh, with each other. In, in 1995, I was asked um, by the NEC Corporation to help them create a, a working model of the university of the future. So what you're seeing here is a, a mock-up screen from 1995 of what a university of the future might look like um, around uh, the year 2000 uh, or so. So you can see it's not too much different from what we're seeing these days. I envision that people could join different kinds of round tables, like white mm -hmm. phones, and they would be able to have multimedia conversations uh, about them. So jump forward uh, to about eight years ago when I started teaching students face-to-face uh, -face in classrooms. And uh, the subjects I teach are about social media and social media issues, so it only makes sense to use uh, social media uh, to talk about the media that, that we're studying. So I put together a, a wiki from social text and, and used uh, a, a Drupal blog, used a forum from another place. And, and one of the things the students told me was that it was confusing to use too many uh, different user interfaces. They had to sign in, log in to each of them. So I uh, applied uh, for a competition that was held by the MacArthur Foundation and won a small award, which I used to hire a, a programmer 
to help me develop what we call the social media classroom. Uh, you can you can find information at it, uh, about it at socialmediaclassroom.com. And I found that, that when we made the social media classroom available, I also needed to make available a lot of information for other educators about how to go about using forums, blogs, wikis, social bookmarking, all of these forums in their teaching. So whenever I developed a lesson plan, I put it up here and made it available. And the School of Information at Berkeley is one of the places that started adopting it and making their own version of it. So I just want to briefly look at the, the media that we use for teaching and learning uh, in, in the classes that I've taught at University of California at Berkeley and at, at Stanford University. So what you're seeing here is the social media classroom, and you'll see at the top of the page there are a number of colored tabs. The idea is that each tab is a portal to a different communication medium so that we can very smoothly move from one to the other. And this is the entrance page to, to the forums. And I think of the forums in terms of the group voice. This is a place where the entire class can continue uh, discussions that start face-to-face -face, but continue throughout the week between class meetings. And like a good conversation in the classroom, it's about the voice of the, the group. Blogs, however, which I ask the students to use simultaneously, are really about individual voice. Now, Traditionally, students write papers and only the teacher sees them. With the blogs, we are publishing for each other and commenting on each other. So there are often very lively conversations that happen around blog posts, as well as in the forums. Uh, however, it's the person who, it's the group who decides what we're going to speak about in the forum. It's the individual who decides what they want to reflect on in the blog. So we use the, the blogs really for reflective learning for, for talking about what it is that, that we're learning and keep the, the group voice and the individual voice going simultaneously. We also use wikis. The syllabus is on uh, a wiki. So the wiki then is, is, a, is a, a tool for collaborative work. And I'll show you a little bit of, about what uh, my students do with the collaborative work. We also use social bookmarks. Uh, so there's, I think of the social media classroom as kind of an on-ramp to Web 2.0. Once you know what you're doing, you can definitely go out and roll your own blogs, your own social bookmarkings, and delicious or deco or another service. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of my students decided they wanted to do the mark up the readings together, so they used Deco, which is an external social bookmarking service. One of the nice things about Digo is it enables you to highlight passages on a page, leave sticky notes for each other on that page, and then create a unique URL that will enable others in your group to, to share your, your notes. So we're, we're making even studying the text more of a social and networked experience. So uh, the next thing uh, that I started to learn was to give more and more of the the power and the responsibility for learning over to the students. So we began to move from a classroom that looked like, like this to one that looked like this. And there are a couple of differences here. One is, uh, notice that the students are looking at each other and not at their laptops. Notice that I'm not the one who's standing up. It's a student who's standing up. And that we have our chairs in a circle. We started sharing the teaching uh, during the class, about a third of the, the class session, their long class sessions, their three-hour class sessions, is led by a co-teaching team of students. And that co-teaching team and I get together and come up with a plan. Their idea is not, is, is not to try to convey everything that's in the texts and the lectures uh, for that section, but to, to choose something and engage uh, all of the other learners um, uh, in it. So. This is a very cooperative class. I told the, the class that almost everything we do, we do cooperatively, but I do encourage them to compete to make their co-learning presentations um, uh, more and more engaging. And they do, and it's pretty exciting when, when they begin taking up the reins of learning themselves. 
Um, and I've asked them to, uh, to use any medium, excuse me, <laughs> any medium except PowerPoint when we make their presentations. One of the things that I ask the co-teaching teams to do is to identify words and phrases that come up in the texts and in our discussions and in my lectures and to add them to the wiki as, as they come up. And then it's the job of everyone in the class to uh, Wikipedia style define and expand the definitions and format the definitions and organize the definitions of the lexicon. At the end of the year when we have our final exam, part of the final exam is to write a narrative based on the lexicon that the students themselves have created using the words in context. I also ask the co-teaching teams to come back the week after their session and at the beginning of the next session to do a mind map of what we had done the week before. There are a couple of reasons for that. One, one is we move so quickly from one subject to another. I want to, the, the students to be able to tie them together as we go along see connections between things. Also, it's an opportunity for visual thinking and, and lateral thinking, along with the other tools in their toolkit. So I just want to briefly show you a couple of these mind maps and concept maps that students have done. Uh, you can do it. You can draw with the colored pens on paper and scan it. Or um, You can see that there's just a, quite a variety of ways that people try to visually represent some of the things that, that come up in class. And here's a student who's adept at Photoshop who made something a lot, lot more uh, polished looking. Um, again, as I said, the syllabus is presented on a wiki. One of the things that I tell my students about this particular class is that there's not really a canon here. Uh, there's not really a fixed amount of knowledge that you're supposed to know. The most important thing, I think, to know about social media is to, to have a good analytic toolbox to think about the media and their in, impacts, their effects on you as an individual and on your relationships um, analytically, to have a good vocabulary, to, to borrow from what social scientists and, and others have, have done in, in their uh, examinations of media and communication and community and, and to have some conceptual frameworks that they can use to begin to make judgments about media. So one of the things that I do is I present the syllabus to them before the first class um, as a wiki, but it's also as a concept map. So this concept map is exactly the same information that's on the, the wiki. It's just presented in a different manner. And also uh, as a Prezi. So to literally give them three different ways of looking at the material. And I encourage them to use different media to look at material in, in different ways. So the group voice, the individual voice, the, the collaborative lexicon, the, the co-teaching teams, and the mind mapping, those all kind of fit together in our, our efforts to, to really become, in the weeks that we have together, a learning community in which we are co-learners. And I am the expert, and I do know the subject, and I'm there to, to frame it, to, to, to steer things uh, back onto, onto the right topic. But uh, for the most part, it's up to the students to inquire using the tools that I'm providing uh, for them uh, together. So um, about a year and a half ago, I started another experiment. I decided that I wanted to, to teach a course uh, entirely online. Uh, this was before a lot of the uh, uh, hype about MOOCs started happening. And, and this is kind of the anti-MOOC. Instead of it being a massive open course, uh, I wanted no more than 30 learners in this course. So I've set up a Rangold U online. Um, people uh, pay me through PayPal. Uh, we use the social media a classroom for uh, the course. We use the, the wiki, the forums, the blog, the mind maps, the social bookmarks, just as I do in the face-to-face -face class. And instead of face-to-face -face meetings, um, we use the same uh, medium that I'm using now 
And we take advantage of the, the ability to use multiple, multiple media in a meeting. So we often have people on four continents, somebody in South Africa, someone in South America, a couple of people in Europe and North America, uh, Australia, uh, online simultaneously. And we can use the, the text chat as a back channel. The other learners can can take the, the, the audio and the video and, and speak as well. We can do screen sharing uh, with that. So it's really the combination of the, the synchronous live sessions and the asynchronous discussion between sessions that we use online. And when we meet online like this, uh, people take on different roles. So the searchers are people who search out uh, relevant resources uh, as I'm talking, as we're talking, and, and put the URLs into the text chat. And the contextualizers take those URLs and write up a two or three or four sentence summary uh, of that and, um, and turn those over to the curators who take a, make a web page um, with, with our mind map, with all of the resources that we've searched, with the summaries with the lexicon in it. So we have a lexicon team uh, as well, and mind mappers. And the idea is to use the whiteboard that we've got here. So you see we've got a, a whiteboard that anybody who's logged in can, can draw on um, or write on. And um, we, all, we, we use this simultaneously to create a kind of uh, brainstormed mind map about what it is that, that uh, we've been talking about. And the idea here is to not try to get a, a, a finished product, but to act as a kind of collective intelligence. So you can't really see who's typing what. You know, um, words just appear on the screen, and then, you know, other people might take those words and move them around and draw connections between things. And you can't really see who's doing what. So almost immediately, a group of, of people who may be all over the world who've never met before are acting together to try to make sense of the, the material that I'm, I'm presenting for them. So that collective sense-making really um, almost immediately gels a sense of a, a live learning community. It's really just the part of a process. The process has to do with trying to make connections, trying to make sense of things uh, together, and trying to display that sense to each other. So one of the things is that the mind map team then takes these kind of brainstormed, rough mind maps that we do together uh, and uh, creates a more refined, distilled version of that. Uh, every week we switch around roles so that um, each uh, co-learner has the opportunity to be a searcher, to be a mind mapper, to, to work on the, on the lexicon. And uh, as people come up with ideas for more roles, we add those roles as well. So one of the things that I saw as I was teaching online was that there are, are more and more platforms to enable people to take advantage of the multimedia communications and the access to, to vast repositories of knowledge to learn things together, to teach each other, and, and to, to um, engage in peer learning outside of the educational institutions as, as we've known them. Um, these all really appeared before the, the, the MOOCs and Coursera and, and uh, Udemy that, uh, that popped up in the last year. So the question, uh, having uh, used social media in the classroom and seen how that affords a more student-centric and collaborative and, and cooperative pedagogy, uh, certainly these are ideas that did not uh, come with the technology. They go back to, to Dewey and Vygotsky and, and Frera and, and others. But the technology has created an environment in which the, a, a more peer-to-peer -peer pedagogy 
uh, becomes much more powerful. So the question there then becomes, in a, in a world of uh, abundant information, inexpensive communication channels, multiple learning platforms, what, what do self-learners need to know in order to effectively teach and learn from each other? We're, we're seeing an enormous amount of peer learning that's, that's happening every day in the, in the gaming community, in the, in the maker community, in, in support communities for, for people who have uh, diseases. We're seeing people um, teaching each other. What, what, what are we going to, to need in order to assemble our own learning? Um, I was encouraged by seeing this project on uh, Kickstarter of someone who wanted to uh, write a book on uh, Don't Go Back to School, a handbook for, for learning uh, anything. So the next uh, experiment that I've started is uh, something I'm, I'm calling uh, pedagogy. Uh, the idea is if we have all of these technologies available, um, what is it that a group of people needs to, to, to know and to do in order to learn together? How, how would they go about qualifying resources, organizing those resources, uh, coming up with uh, learning activities, dividing the, the labor of facilitating? Uh, how would they structure their discussions? How would they assess their, their learning? Um, I think that all, all of these things are not secret the people are doing these things all over the place. So the idea was, I, I did, made a, a lecture at the University of California at, at Berkeley and invited people to join me. A group of about um, 30 people started out. The project's been going on for about a year. And so we didn't know each other. We needed to self-organize. We used all of the media that I've been telling you about here to organize our own effort, and it's pretty surprising for a group of people who have no financial incentives, um, no other institutional uh, connection, uh, just uh, interested in peer learning and started putting this together. So we, we started out with some face-to-face -face seminars at, at Berkeley, and we've been doing it online since then. And the idea is to create a, a, an editable handbook for peer learning. So we started out with a, a wiki uh, that we you know, really developed our method as we went along. And, and the, the wiki is uh, where we, we developed the outline for the project. And so the outline has, we're, we, uh, much as Wikipedia does, we start outline headings or, or stubs and then people like them and then turn them over to an editing team and then when they're edited we move them over to a WordPress publication. So this is actually, so we use the forums to talk about uh, what it is we're doing. So you can see you can embed videos in the forum discussions as well. And if you go to puregaji.org you will see the actual handbook. Um, so we've got videos in it. It's, I'd say it's 80% or 90% there. Um, I think we, we have a world in which people have been schooled into a lot of learned helplessness about uh, learning new things. The education system really trains people to comply to the education system. Yet at the same time, as, as humans, we, we're hungry to learn, and we're always learning from each other. And now we've got all of this material from Wikipedia to YouTube uh, to, to Google that's available online for us to use, for the most part, for free. So I think we're going to see more and more people taking on self-learning projects uh, as, as groups, and uh, not only learning the subject together, but learning how to learn things together. Um, so uh, you, can, you can take a look at that URL to, to see the site. That's Rheingold University there. 
And I'll just put this up here. You want to see what the... Uh, finished product looks like. So, um, I would open the floor for uh, questions at this point. <laughs>